I see. All right. Okay. We can finally we can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Song Gang uh, from the School of Chinese at HKU. Uh, I serve as the uh, chief editor of our school's uh, Journal of uh, Chinese Studies. You can see uh, two issues there. Actually, the second issue of uh, this journal with the new name is uh, uh, HKU Journal of Chinese Studies has just uh, published uh, a few days ago. Yeah, uh, formerly it's known as a Journal of uh, Oriental Studies, uh, but with this new name, this is the second issue. Yeah, uh, so I'm very glad <laughs> that for this uh, new publication. And uh, also uh, uh, I'm pleased that uh, we can uh, launch uh, this uh, uh, distinguished uh, scholar lecture series uh, for this uh, journal. And uh, Professor Zhang Longxi has uh, kindly uh, agreed, uh, accepted our invitation. And uh, he's here to give uh, the very first uh, lecture in this uh, uh, Distinguished uh, Scholar Lecture Series, okay? Uh, before I give you an uh, introduction of uh, Professor Zhang, I would like to invite uh, the head of our school, uh, Dr. Lin Peiyan, to say uh, a few words uh, to officially uh, start our uh, Distinguished Scholar Lecture Series. Uh, Dr. Lin Peiyan, please. Good, good, evening, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to give the full credit to my very helpful colleague, Dr. Song Gang, because uh, without his uh, sort of uh, un ongoing devotion, uh, we would not be able to have this uh, new faces of, of the new journal. So uh, I would like to say a few words about the history of this journal, because it was actually uh, had a very, uh, it was established probably I think 1954, yeah. So if you do a very simple math, uh, this is like um, 69th year so of this journal if it's a human being. So it had a very, very long and very proud history. But um, we would like to say a few words like uh, why we changed the name because uh, it was formerly named Oriental Studies, Dongfang Wenhua. So as you have known, since Edward Said published his very monumental book, Orientalism. So this very sort of um, othering act has been problematized by a lot of scholars. So in order to have the more sort of a fresh look uh, into a uh, sinology or sinological studies, we collectively decided to give it a new name. So it's now called uh, Xiangang Dashu Zhongwen Xue Ba. It's a lot more neutral, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, if you have browsed some of the issues, then you will know we actually try very hard to give it a new basis. So we have different sort of sections and then it's like a different themes. So hopefully it will reach a wider readership as well. So um, before uh, we invited uh, Professor Zhang to start, I would just like to say um, some sort of a personal connection with him because uh, I first met Professor Zhang uh, several years ago, probably in Hong Kong. It was actually a uh, sort of a Harvard Yanjing Institute, sort of alumni gathering. So I'm very proud that we were sort of connected because uh, of, of course, uh, uh, Professor Zhang is like a sort of um, our sort of a pioneering scholar uh, associated with Harvard Yanjing Institute. And then I only visited like uh, several years later, but I'm very happy to have this sort of little connection. And actually another very personal connection is my first book happened to be published by Brio under a very special series uh, for which Professor John is actually one of the two series editors. So even till now, I'm still very grateful for his support and encouragement to make this happen. So this is sort of a anecdote. So just try to say, um, Professor John, although he's very sort of um, established scholar, but he's still very, very kind to junior scholars or younger generation. So now we are very, very pleased to 
welcome him to Hong Kong U to give a talk. And I will probably give this microphone back to the moderator of today's talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Yeah. All right. Uh, now I just uh, gave uh, a very brief uh, introduction of Professor Zhang, but actually, <laughs> really, uh, just trace back uh, Professor Zhang's uh, academic, you know, life. It's, uh, it's going to take a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, Professor Zhang is an in, uh, internationally renowned uh, scholar in East-West cross-cultural studies. He received his MA degree from uh, Peking University and his PhD degree from Harvard. Uh, he, he has taught at uh, PKU, uh, Harvard, and uh, UC Riverside, and uh, CityU uh, for uh, many years. Um, after retirement from CityU in June this year, just uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, he is now uh, Xiaoxiang Chair Professor of Comparative Literature at Hunan Normal University in Changsha. Um, Professor Zhang is affiliated, affiliated with uh, prestigious uh, academies in Europe. He was the elected president of the International Comparative Literature Association from 2016 to 2019. He also served in several leading journals in this field. Uh, by the way, you know, I wish that uh, you know we could have a chance to invite him to join the advisor board of our journal as well. <laughs> um, we'll send the invitation to you soon, <laughs> maybe after this lecture. <laughs> yeah, very soon. Yeah, many of you are familiar with his uh, voluminous uh, publications. He's uh, really a, a, a highly productive scholar, publishing a number of impactful uh, monographs, book series, and uh, articles over the years. Indeed, a role model for other scholars in the field, including me. Yeah. Um, it is impossible for me to name all of uh, Professor Zhang's publications, but uh, the research output he has done uh, including the most recent book, this, this book, World Literature as Discovery, Expanding the World Literary Canon, um, which has uh, been uh, published just uh, uh, last month, right? In, in September. This month, this month, okay. Uh, by Rutledge, a well-known uh, publisher. Um, uh, so his uh, research outputs have certainly led to major methodological shift in world literature, comparative literature, and cross-cultural studies. Uh, today, we are greatly honored to have him and uh, present a lecture titled Chinese Literature in the Framework of uh, uh, World Literature. Um, so he will share with us his uh, critical thinking of a spectrum of key issues, such as world literature, canonical works, aesthetic values, literary translations, and in particular, the ways in which Chinese literature may be duly recognized and appreciated as part of rising world literature in the 21st century. Now, without further ado, Please join me and welcome Professor Zhang to start, start his lecture. Professor, Professor Zhang, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Chung, and also uh, thank you, Lin, for the nice words. Uh, so I will um, maybe try to finish in 40, 45 minutes uh, about this uh, topic, Chinese literature in the framework of world literature. Um, I think we all know that in 20th century, uh, 21st century, in the last 20 years or so, maybe um, world literature is the new wave in literary studies everywhere is on the rise. And I can quote uh, Theo Dan, uh, is a very close friend of mine. By the way, Theo Dan, David Damrosch and myself 
but we are the um, we have we set up a journal of world literature we are the chief editors um so we are very close um till then in his Routridge concise history of world literature he says no other approach to literary studies has known as spectacular a success in a new millennium that is in the 21st century as that which goes by the name of world literature so you can see that world literature is now very very um uh, popular uh, in literary studies on the rise, uh, not just in the United States and Europe, but everywhere in China, uh, in Turkey, in India, uh, in Brazil, and many other parts of the world. Now, sooner or later, when we talk about world literature, we'll always go back to Goethe, the German poet in the uh, early 19th century. Um, he was the first to talk about Literatur. The German, of course, you can, you can tell it's very close to world literature. Uh, the same word, actually. Um, now, he was not the first to coin this term. Sometimes people talked about Goethe as though he invented this term. No, he didn't. Before him, already some German uh, poets like Willen uh, already used that term. But when Goethe was talking about this in the early 19th century, when Goethe was in his old age, he was a very important figure, very well respected in Europe. So many people, uh, scholars often visited him and uh, talked with him. So when he talked about literature, of course, uh, um, a lot of people pay attention. And he uh, mentioned the term literature in, in several occasions, but the most important one and often quoted one was the one that uh, was a very famous in um, when he talked about uh, what literature with his young secretary, uh, Johann Peter Eckermann. Eckermann uh, was a young man, he admired Goethe, so he went to uh, um, work with him and he recorded his conversations with him and afterwards published a book called Gesprät mit Goethe, Conversation with Goethe. Uh, you know, um, uh, Nietzsche, the German uh, philosopher, once mentioned, if you want to just read one book to, to learn about German literature, you should read Gesprät mit Goethe. <laughs> You're not reading any work, really, of literature, but Conversations with Goethe. That was the important book to give you a better idea of what is going on in German literature or the literary world uh, at the time. And because the conversation was noted as well, almost like a diary, so we know exactly what time Goethe was talking about this. And as you can see, it's January 31st, 1827. We know exactly the date because that date, um, he um, was talking with Eckermann. And from the very beginning, world literature has a special, if, uh, if fortuitous relationship with Chinese literature. Why? Because when Eckermann went to see Goethe, Goethe says, um, in the last few days, I'm reading a Chinese novel. <laughs> now, uh, he didn't mention which one. I mean, uh, scholars have discussed, debated on which one is the novel that Goethe was reading. And it came to the conclusion, it's still debatable. Uh, there are two candidates. One is uh, Yu Jiao Li. The other is Hao Qiu Zhuan. And none of this is really the great Chinese novel like Hong Meng or anything, but well, still. Those works were translated by the Jesuit missionaries in French, and uh, Goethe was written not in Chinese, of course, uh, was in reading in French translation. So from the very beginning, you can see that the idea of what literature has some connection with Chinese literature, and also has very close relationship with translation, okay? And uh, when, when Eckermann uh, heard Goethe was reading a Chinese novel, he said, he said, it must be very strange, you're reading a Chinese novel. And Goethe said, no, it's not as strange as you thought. And he said, the Chinese are just like us Germans, and we are very much like them. And uh, so it was reading a non-European novel. This is very important. In 19th century, uh, early 19th century, Goethe was way ahead of his time, uh, much more cosmopolitan than most of his contemporaries. He was reading a Chinese novel. He said the Chinese were just like us. It, it, the, the difference is that they are much better than us, you know. And uh, Eckermann said, well, uh, you like that novel so much. Is that the best Chinese novel? Goethe said, no, not at all. Uh, they have thousands of these works. When, we're, when our, this is very famous, when our forefathers still living in the woods, 
in other words, Europeans were still very much a primitive, you know, uh, a forest, uh, you know, animals, and the Chinese were already uh, writing Chinese uh, great novels. I mean, this is, of course, Goethe was a, a little exaggerated a little bit, but he knew that Chinese history is a long, you know, um, dating back uh, thousands of years. So it was in that context, reading a non-European novel, that Goethe came to this conclusion. This is very important and very often quoted passage from his conversation with Eckermann. He said, I'm more and more convinced that poetry is a universal possession of mankind, revealing itself everywhere and all, uh, at all times in hundreds and hundreds of men. National literature is now rather an unmeaningful, um, unmeaning term. The epoch of work literature is at hand and everyone must strive to hasten its approach. So that's a very famous passage. It's very often quoted. So here you can see that it's very important to, to, to see that there is some connection with Chinese novel. Uh, of course, it's fortuitous, not necessary. It, has, it didn't have to be a Chinese novel, but the point is, Goethe was very much interested in um, non-European literature. It was much more cosmopolitan. In 19th century, unfortunately, uh, before I um, came to this, when Goethe talked about world literature, many of the European scholars of the time, particularly the French scholars, would understand his term to mean European literature. And Goethe has a very famous uh, um, play called Toccato Tasso. Toccato Tasso is an Italian, uh, Renaissance Italian poet, and he wrote a play on, on Toccato Tasso. And Toccato Tasso was um, uh, adopted in French and put on the stage. So Goethe was very happy. So he said, now it proves that the time of world literature is already here. He, of course, talked in German. And what he used in this term is Weltliteratur. And then the French journal, Le Globe, uh, the, the, um, the Globe is the same word in English, um, reported Goethe's uh, remarks. And when it came out in French, what he called, what Goethe used, Weltliteratur becomes literature européenne, you know, <laughs> become European literature. So for 19th century, remember 19th century was a time of Western expansion of imperialism and colonialism. So most of the European scholars would think that the only literature worth studying must be European, okay? So, no, so this is very important to remember that Goethe was talking about the world literature when he was reading a Chinese novel but the French and many other, not just French actually, many European scholars at the time would understand uh, world literature within limits of Europe. Um, of course, in 19th century, uh, the literary study, the discipline uh, beyond nationalism and its correlated um, uh, monolingualism is comparative literature. Okay, comparative literature started in 19th century as a progressive effort to overcome the danger of nationalism. We all know how dangerous nationalism was for the, you know, in the 20th century, the two world wars. So nationalism, uh, the idea that the national principle, the idea that our country or my country is the best in the world, that my literature is best in the world, which was very dangerous. And a group of European scholars, much more, sort of open-minded and progressive uh, came to the idea of that uh, uh, literary studies should go beyond nationalism. And therefore comparative literature was formed in the 19th century as a discipline to overcome um, nationalism. So in that sense, comparative literature started as an effort, a humanistic effort to overcome the limitations of nationalism and monolingualism. So comparative literature from the very start was not defined by comparison because we compare everything all the time. So comparison, comparative is not the defining character of comparative literature. So sometimes I still remember in, um, in the early 1980s when, when uh, China, when comparative literature was revived in Chinese, uh, in China, and some scholars have misunderstanding. We say, oh, we have compared literature in ancient time because we always compare Li Bo, Du Fu, you know, Tang Shi, Song Si, all this can be compared, but that's not a fundamental misunderstanding. Comparative literature doesn't mean you compare literary works, but you compare different languages 
and the literary works. So comparative literature from the very beginning was very much laying emphasis on linguistic competence. You must know at least two and ideally more. And actually the ideal concept is decaglutismus, 10 languages. And the first editor of this comparative literature journal, uh, Hugo Metzo, he was a, a Hungarian speaking, and born in Hungary, but a German speaking uh, scholar. And of course you understand that's 19th century. That was when the um, Austro-Hungarian empire was, was the time. So, um, uh, so he uh, asked a German speaking scholar in Hungary, uh, we all know that European uh, countries, many of the small states, small um, countries uh, would have much more, you know, languages, just one, you know, you talk to a Dutch scholar, for example, he can speak German like the German tank, speak French like the French. I mean, really they speak several languages as they're almost like native languages. So that's very common. So European, um, so it's quite understandable that European comparative literature uh, would require scholars comparatives have many more languages than just one or two. I mean, of course, lit, uh, even today, um, the um, some of the uh, you know American universities, for example, Harvard, Leo, uh, Princeton, they would usually require three languages: um, French, German, and plus a uh, classical language, Greek or Latin. I mean, English is not a foreign language in America, so so uh, <laughs> so that's out. Um, but the idea of decaglutismus that uh, Hugo Mezzo proposed for European comparatists with no exception are all European languages. So therefore, as I said, in 19th century, the only literature was studying for them uh, was European literature. So it's uh, really, it's compared. And of course, going back to the um, uh, ancient time was Greek and Latin. So typically a European scholar, uh, scholar of comparative literature would know several European languages, but not, not really non-European languages. Of course, there are second sinologists, for example, or Indian and Indologists, but they spend all their time to learn a Chinese or Indian language and they never really did. Um, so so in, the, the point is East-West comparative study was impossible in 19th century and much of 20th century. Before 1970s, I would think in America, you couldn't do a PhD uh, using Chinese as one of the literatures. Uh, so it's really late, very late that they gradually tolerate or accept the idea of East-West studies. But Goethe, as I said, in early 19th century was already proposing the idea of Vertical Couture, reading a Chinese novel in translation, which is quite different from a, what a comparative study scholar would do. But Goethe, of course, didn't define the term very clearly. What exactly is word literature or vetriatur? So this is in mid 20th century, uh, Claudio Guillén, he's a great comparatist, he's Spanish. His father is very famous uh, Spanish national poet called uh, Jorge Guillén. Uh, Claudio, of course, he was very kind of uh, uh, <laughs> progressive intellectual. So he refused to be in Spain when uh, Franco was in charge. So he uh, he was at Harvard actually. When I was Harvard, uh, he was one of my teachers. He's very, very good. Um, and when Franco died, he went back to um, uh, Spain and became a professor in Barcelona. He died in Barcelona. Now, he, I think in, in my view, uh, he wrote the best compar introduction to comparative literature, even today. Uh, he wrote in Spanish, but it's translated in, into English and published by Harvard in 1993, uh, which is called the, um, the Challenge of Comparative Literature, in which he talked about Goethe's idea of word literature, and he uh, has some complaint or critique of Goethe's idea. He says, what can we make of such an idea? The sum total of all national literatures, a wild idea, unattainable in practice, worthy not of an actual reader, but of a deluded keeper of archives who is also a multimillionaire. <laughs> so the idea is nobody would think of word literature. What do you mean word literature? And all the works in, in the world is so much. I mean, the huge amount of literary works make it impossible for anybody to read word literature. We always read in a language. We read English literature, French literature, Russian, Chinese, whatever, but nobody 
can read all the languages in the world, and nobody therefore can read world literature in that sense. So world literature is not a simple term. It's impossible in a quantitative term. Nobody can read. It doesn't matter how fast or how, how many languages you know or how fast you can read. You spend your, all your life, you cannot read world literature. So that idea has to be redefined to, be, to become a workable um, uh, uh, object for study. So that's why in 19th century and early uh, much of 20th century, world literature was not really a subject for study and it was almost forgotten, okay? Um, but he did mention two possible understanding of the term. Um, those are very important uh, as we can see. The, the second point he said, those works that have been read and appreciated beyond the frontiers of their countries of origin. That is to say, works that was not just read by native speakers, but read by foreigners. Those works could be world literature, works of world literature. And that's that's one. Um, but he dismissed this concept because world literature, as I said, was, was appropriate by European scholars, particularly French. I mean, French, of course, has very good reason to believe their language is the best and their literature was the best because it is a very rich tradition and wonderful works in French literature is no, no question about that. Uh, but the French also had, um, you know, very uh, kind of uh, arrogant attitude in a way. I mean, sometimes you, I, I participate in many of these projects, international collaborations and writing history of literature. And sometimes they joke about if you have a thousand pages of history of the world literature, and then 700 must be about French literature. <laughs> which of course is a joke. <laughs> Nobody would agree. But indeed, they, uh, as I said, the French translate literature literally as literature uh, européenne, that is European literature. So, so really, I mean, so uh, Claude Guillen uh, dismissed this idea and saying it's it's, it's not possible. And then he also mentions uh, works of writers of the first or very high rank, that is canonical works, classics, those works should be or could be world literature. Now, as I said, for much of 19th century and much of 20th century, world literature, Goethe's idea was not really um, uh, very much, um, you know, paid attention to and didn't really work, didn't become a field of study. So redefining world literature uh, was very important. And David Damrush, I think, is perhaps the most successful in redefining this term. And in his book, What is World Literature? Uh, he has this basically redefinition uh, of, of the idea. World literature encompasses all literary works that circulate beyond the uh, culture of origin, either in translation or in the original language. And, in, uh, and his example is Virgil. Virgil was long read in Latin in Europe. Now, uh, so there are a number of things we can pay attention to. First uh, is, of course, the, the, the defining factor for David Damrosch is circulation, okay? Or just, and circulation beyond its culture of origin. In other words, a famous work, if it is only read by readers of its native tradition, you know, this is, applies to Chinese literature, for example. Chinese literature has almost three millennium of long history, has numerous great works with very high literary values. <clears throat> but let's face the fact, outside China, very few people have heard of Li Bo, Du Fu, Tao Yuanmin, Su Dongpo, Cao Jueqin, Li Qingzhao. All these names mean nothing. Okay, so a work may be very um, well known and also very high value, but if it is not circulating beyond its culture of origin, in other words, if a Chinese work is only read by the Chinese, it's a national classic, it's a national, a great work of national literature, it's not part of world literature. World literature has to be works that read by people um, outside the original linguistic and cultural environment, okay? 
So that's very important, circulation. And of course, there are two ways of circulation. One is in translation. You know, for most works not written in a major language, the way to become part of world literature is through translation and translation into a major language. By major, of course, we mean a language that has circulating uh, and uh, are used for international communications. I mean, uh, Virgil, for example, uh, was long read in European Latin because Latin was they called lingua franca, which means like Putonghua, basically. Lingua franca is really Putonghua. What is Putonghua? It's because in China, you know, people have different, you know, I mean, ashamed of myself. I have been in Hong Kong for 26 years, but I still don't speak Cantonese. <laughs> I don't speak Shanghainese either. I'm from Chengdu, uh, Sichuan. So uh, in China, this is not uncommon. There are many, many different parts, different areas. And sometimes if you go to Guangxi, for example, one village speak a language, the next village speak another. It's very difficult. So, but Putonghua is beyond all this. So that's the language we all speak, Putonghua. <laughs> Lingua Franca was exactly like that. And in Europe, from late antiquity to the 19th century, and perhaps even early uh, 20th century, um, anybody who is educated must read Latin. Okay. And many of the great universities like Oxford, Cambridge, will require students to learn Latin. But this is no longer true. Now, even Oxford and Cambridge don't require students to read Latin anymore. Even though every year, for example, every year at Harvard commencement, they would have a student give a Latin uh, commencement speech. <clears throat> and sometimes <clears throat> classic professors will complain that Latin, the level of Latin is declining because there are many mistakes. <clears throat> anyway, so Latin was the lingua franca for a long time in Europe. And the same we can apply to classical Chinese. Wen Yan was also a lingua franca in East Asia before the 19th century. Because Wen Yan or Chinese, classical Chinese, was not just used by Chinese, but also by the Japanese, the Koreans, the Vietnamese. Their history, their literature were all written in classical Chinese. And that, of course, became a problem for, for modern time. Vietnam, of course, in the 19th century, the French Jesuits, not, not Jesuits, but French missionaries invented their uh, a, a way of you know, uh, recording their language in Latin, uh, in Latin uh, alphabet with some uh, diacritics. So you can see that Vietnamese use Latin uh, with a lot of uh, signs. You know? um, Hangul, uh, the Korean uh, language, was invented already in the, I think, in the 16th century, uh, 15 something. Uh, in uh, by the emperor uh, uh, king uh, Sejong, but Hangul was never used until 1960s. Uh, of course, when I said never used, I mean it's never used for important documentations. You write history, you write, write literature, you write anything that that's just, that's important. You couldn't write in Hangul because the Korean yangbuns, the Korean kind of Confucian scholars had very good Chinese. And they always consider this as a rank, a, a prestige. I mean, uh, if, you are, if you're somebody in society, you don't write in Hangul. Hangul is only used by women, unfortunately, or ill-educated or undeducated people. Until 1960s, I was told by many Korean friends uh, in South Korea anyway, uh, you know, they didn't use Hangul. Uh, North Korea, uh, uh, Hangul was used Earlier, but anyway, now um, has a problem. Koreans cannot read their own history and literature. I still remember the first time I went to Korea. A graduate student from Korea University was to be my tour guide, so he took me to the uh, palace, the Korean in Seoul. But I became his tour guide because I read all the writings on the wall and translated into uh, uh, English for him, and he didn't have any idea. Uh, so that was the problem. Um, so Wen Yan was a lingua franca in East Asia before the, the 19th century. Uh, but today, neither Latin nor Chinese is the lingua franca. The de facto lingua franca in the post-World War world is English. In 19th century, French was close uh, to be used. 
uh, you know, for for particularly for uh, aristocrats and intellectuals, French was very important. Uh, so, for example, Tolstoy in writing his War and Peace, all the noble people talk in French, and he wrote directly in French. That was the time in nineteenth century, but no longer true. Very painful for the French, uh, but that's the um, reality today. If you publish uh, in English, you have more readers than French or any other language. If you have an international conference, you really, it's English. You know, people from different countries use English to present their ideas and communicate and exchange and so on. So English becomes the de facto lingua franca. Um, now, David is a, is a very close friend of mine, but his idea, his redefinition of world literature, even though it's very, very helpful, and I think it's instrumental um, uh, in the rise of world literature today, because it made world literature no longer a wild idea, as uh, Kulogian criticized, but a workable idea, because circulation beyond its culture of origin, that would reduce a huge number of works, particularly non-Western works. For example, Chinese literature, as I said, even though we Chinese love it so much, and I love Chinese literature, uh, but then you have to realize because I I was you know in the U.S. and Europe quite often uh, for a very long time, and there's an obvious imbalance of knowledge between the West and the rest. In non-Western cultures, in China, for example, I'm sure all of you at least heard of the name, if you not really read the works of Plato, Aristotle, you know, Dante, Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, you know, many, many Western poets, um, Western culture, you know, just not just poets, but musicians. You must have heard Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, you know. Uh, a college ed a college educated student in China would have knowledge of this. But if you go to America or Europe, not just the student, but even a literary scholar who, you know, a specialist studying literature, a comparatist, would have no idea who the great Chinese poets and writers are. Okay, the only Chinese name that is internationally well known is Confucius. I admit that, but Confucius, notice Confucius, C I U S, is a Latinist uh, word that was made by the Jesuit missionaries with our agenda, because when Jesuit missionaries came to China, they wanted to convert Chinese into a, a Christian country, and they realized Confucianism was very influential. The scholars are very important. So they made Confucius and Mencius, Kongzi, Mengzi, as Confucius and Mencius, and it sounded like a Roman philosopher, right? <clears throat> but not Lao Tzu or Chuang Tzu. <laughs> you can immediately tell this is not European. But Confucius and Mencius is different. Now, Confucius became the only name perhaps uh, well-known uh, outside China, but not any of the great works of literature was well-known. Now, in rede redefining the word, uh, the, the concept of word literature, uh, David, of course, made it um, possible to work with um, a, a num still a very big number, but still, you know, uh, is not as huge as uh, all the sum of all uh, liter literature of the world. And he used circulation as the important concept, the defining character <clears throat> that has its um, advantage, that is to exclude a lot of works that are not circulating beyond the culture of origin as, as Chinese literature and any of the non-Western literatures, as well as the so-called minor European literatures. For example, I can ask you, who is the greatest Dutch poet? Anybody knows? I don't think you know. <laughs> because Dutch, even though it's a very important culture, has wonderful painters, right? Scientists, philosophers. You must have heard of Spinoza. You have heard of, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, Kepler, uh, and also, uh, Painters like Rembrandt, who hasn't, you know, seen a Rembrandt painting, Vermeer, you know, Van der Weyden. There are so many great painters, philosophers, scientists are very well known. 
but you never heard of a great Dutch poet. Okay. So that is also the situation. Not just non-Western literatures was not part of world literature, but even minor European literatures. Of course, some minor European literature may have world famous figures. Uh, for example, Ibsen, you know, a Norwegian playwright, and very famous at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, Lu Xun also, uh, you know, discussed uh, Nora. Uh, uh, you know, what happens when Nora has left, right? The famous essay, Nor Na Zou Ho Zen Yang. And also Lu Xun wrote his uh, work, uh, Shang Shi, you know, as a response to um, uh, Ibsen's work. So Ibsen, anyway, was a very uh, a very famous world uh, literature figure. But Ibsen was not known in his Norwegian original. He was first translated into German and known in Berlin in particular, the, uh, the Folkbühner, the, 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 uh, the People's Theater actually, uh, in, in Berlin, made him very famous. We all know Hans Christian Andersen, a Danish writer, right? Who hasn't read Andersen's fairy tales? I, I loved the fairy tales when I was young. Uh, I'm sure you also have heard of Andersen, you haven't read it. Um, and also Metlink, uh, an, uh, a Swedish poet. But Metlink was known in French translation, Anderson was known in French and English translation, and no, uh, uh, Ibsen was known through German translation. In other words, there are works not known in their native language because of minor language, very small number of people, um, but through translation into a major language. By major, I mean German, French, English, to a lesser extent, Spanish, Italian. Uh, so. That's the situation. So you translation becomes very important. But but circulation, uh, David's um, redefinition, use circulation as the defining character. Um, uh, as I said, it's, it has its positive side, but also has its negative side. Because the widely circulating works are not necessarily the best of literal works. Best sellers, you know, every time you have New York list of bestsellers and many different types of list of bestsellers, most of those works were read and forgotten. They're not really classics. They were not really great works of literature that is remembered by, you know, generations of, of readers. So that's why, you know, uh, it's very difficult to say who is the great world literature figure today because they're still alive. For me, it's canonical works, classics, that has already you know, withstood the taste of time, so to speak. A classic work is a work that is read and appreciated by different generations writers, uh, uh, readers under very different uh, social, political, hi historical conditions. Those works are constantly read and commented on, and those became uh, great works of, of um, canonical works. My idea of what literature should be the um, Integration or the combination of the best of all the works in the in the world, not just uh, the major European traditions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but David's idea, he of course is is very liberal and very open minded. So he said, "World literature is not an infinite." Ungraspable canon of works, but rather a mode of circulation and of reading, a mode that is as applicable to individual works as to bodies of materials, available for reading established classics and new discoveries alike. So basically, he redefined the concept of world literature. And if the purpose of redefining, remember why you have to redefine world literature, because it's, it's simply too much. You cannot read all the works in the, in the world. So the problem with the undefining world literature is too many works to read. And our life is limited. You know, our time is limited. You cannot spend your time without choice, without discrimination. Okay, so we have to make choices. But uh, if, if the redefinition is to solve that problem, to make the impossibly huge amount of works uh, and exclude many of them and saying only those 
circulating beyond the culture of origin. Those are works of literature, uh, of world literature. That is a good thing. But then now you open this to, you know, classics and new discoveries and everything can be, and that becomes, that's self-defeating, basically. Defeat the very purpose of redefining, redefining uh, world literature. So I, I have some disagreement with David on this point, but I can very well understand why. Because in the postmodern age, particularly in American universities, with all this kind of political correctness, it's impossible to talk about literary values and value judgment. You cannot judge. I mean, the judge, who, who are you? Who, uh, you know, why you have this position and power to judge? So nobody can. So nobody talks about canon. Nobody talks about classics. Nobody talks about aesthetic values and reading with pleasure. All this become problematic. That is why uh, David cannot really use literary value in his redefinition of word literature in the um, you know, situation in American universities. You know, uh, I, I don't think that's good. You know, I, I, I always argue against that. In the 1990s, early 90s, in American uh, literary um, studies, some people you know, proposed the idea of decanonization. Have you heard of this? Decanonization, that is, to get rid of all the canons, canon that is great works, and all the great works, Shakespeare, Dante, all those men, you know, dead white males, all the works are written by them. And uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, we cannot endorse their, their ideology, they were all repressive ideologies and so on. Um, therefore, in that um, kind of thinking, and indeed that is very true, if you look at the um, curricula, in many, many of the uh, departments of literature and others, there is a rampant presentism. That is the present is the only thing that is good because we can stand on the moral height of the present moment and looking at the past, they're all a you know, huge mistake. The past is always backward, reactionary, um, not progressive. Only we now, we are, the progressive generation, the me generation, and so on. And that is a very bad thing, you know, uh, not only individualistic and, uh, you know, uh, egoistic, but really a, a very bad uh, influence on the study of literature and the study of anything. And I, for one, I will always argue for the value of literature, for the aesthetic values of literature, and also for the canonical classics. Uh, so I, I have some uh, disagreement here. But of course, um, not just me, but now uh, in more recent time, the people also have some uh, criticism of circulation as a sociological concept. It's a value neutral concept. Here we have this uh, uh, picture is Galen Tihanov. He's a very good scholar. <coughs> um, uh, recently published an essay, uh, or he edited a book, actually. In that book, he had this essay, Beyond Circulation. He says, circulation does not seem to me to be furnishing the right optic here, because the idea of ready artifacts freely moving, uh, uh, freely moving through the supply chain of the book market imagines the speed um, the spaces traversed by literature as flat, leveled, and somewhat monotonous terrains, whereas in reality, their relief is rather varied. So his critique is that circulation is a sociological concept. It's talked about how book can be sold and, and basically it's, it's sales department in any of the publishers, they would talk about circulation very well because how much you can sell and how many uh, copies you can sell and all that. Um, he also continues to, uh, to say this, is it <coughs> word literature which as a discourse is generally far removed from classic literary theory based as the latter often was um, up to and even including deconstruction and close reading of texts this plays here an important proximity to the value neutral approach taken for example by structuralist uh, semiotics that would examine 
uh, Barzak's novels with the same devotion it would extend to lowbrow literature or the study of commercials and company slogans. The emphasis on circulation, I argue, is a methodological expression of this value-neutral approach, which sees literature as generating profit and success rather than aesthetic value, the latter being an uncomfortably contestable entity. You know, uncomfortable, <laughs> uncomfortably contested entity. That is what I was talking about earlier, that in uh, in particular in America. Now, uh, Galen uh, Tihanov is uh, a professor in London, not in the US. So European scholars are slightly different actually. I, you know, uh, in America it's, it's much more extreme in a way. So in America, it's very difficult to talk about value and talk about pleasure, talk about aesthetic uh, uh, values and so on. So, um, uh, so he emphasizes on aesthetic values. And that is very important, I think, because if you think of the great works of literature that really we love, uh, those canonical works, they become canonical works because of the aesthetic values, not from other perspective. I give one uh, uh, <clears throat> very uh, familiar example. Du Fu, of course, has always been the greatest Chinese poet since his own time, actually, from mid Tang, He is already considered the great Chinese poet. But of course, from the Confucian point of view, many commentators would argue that Du Fu is greatest because he writes about the suffering of the people. You know, jian ji ku. You know, and he suffered because he lived through the Anshi rebellion period, Anshi Zhiluan. So he saw uh, the war and devastation of wars and also uh, he personally experienced that. And that made him a great poet. Well, I think it's a dubious argument because in Chinese history, there are, if not millions, but it is thousands of poets who all want to, to write about suffering of the people and always want to, you know, and also, uh, um, loyal to the country, to the to the emperor, to and so on. But Du Fu is only one. Is Du Fu, because he wrote the most sophisticated and the most beautiful Lu Shi regulated verse. And Lu Shi, of course, since Tang became the most powerful, most influential form of of, of poetry, of important uh, genre. And that's why Du Fu was the greatest poet because considered by many uh, generations of later poets all wanted to emulate Du Fu or wrote poems like him. So not because you write, yeah, of course, the content is important. Indeed, writing about suffering of the people is moving, but there are many, many people, uh, many, many, many poets and writers writing about the same. But Du Fu is the greatest, not because of his content, the, the content he wrote about, but the way he wrote about it. his literary values, his technique. He himself said, you know, you know, I will never rest if my words do not startle people, you know? <laughs> so his lines are always different from many others. And that is the reason why he became the greatest Chinese poet in history. So um, the formal um, uh, achievement in, in poetic form uh, is what made Du Fu the greatest poet, okay? So aesthetic value is very, very important. Now, David Damrush in his book, uh, What is a Word Literature? The very last chapter, he uh, quoted the famous poem by Andrew Marvel, even though he didn't give it the name, but it's so famous. Anybody you know, with some knowledge would know. The last concluding chapter in his book is called Word Enough and Time. Of course, that referred to the effectiveness of redefining the word the concept of word literature, because as I said, we cannot read all the works in the world. We don't we don't have uh, enough time to read all of them. So that was the point. But indeed, I would argue even more so, uh, circulation is not good enough because circulation does not differentiate really great works of literature from you know works with with little or even no literary values. So I would very strongly argue canon and world literature. Literature, world literature should be the best of all the different traditions, literary traditions, not just the European. Of course, I'm not, I mean, not putting down European. I'm not against 
European uh, literature. I actually I learned European literature. I taught European literature all the time. When I was in the U.S., I never taught Chinese. I taught comparative literature, uh, mostly about European literature. So I have no, you know, idea to say that European literature is not good. But world literature should not just be literature of the European tradition. It should include great work of any uh, many different literary traditions in the world, including Chinese, of course. China. You know, is a country that has this uh, the uh, writing system is consistently used the longest one, because what is ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient India, they are ancient because they're broken. You know, ancient Greek is not the modern Greek. Uh, even Latin is no longer used, and ancient India, um, you know, text in Sanskrit. You know, the average Indians have no idea how to read Sanskrit. But in China, even though some young students may have trouble, but if you spend some time to learn classical Chinese, we can still read Confucius, Zhuangzi, Laozi in the original, not in translation. And that is something very important. We may not notice this because, well, sure. But this is very unique in the world, actually. No European or American can read Greek or Latin, you know, easily, except you, you become a, stud, uh, a classicist. Otherwise, no be, you know, most of the people would not read their um, ancient texts in the original, but we still can. I would prefer read Confucius in the original than modern translations. Most modern translations uh, are not as good. Um, so that's the difference. China has a history the literary history almost 3000 years and there's so many great works you know in different genres but nobody outside china knows about them and that is the um the imbalance of knowledge i mentioned earlier and that is a very unsatisfying situation and we must try to change it because we don't have time to read everything so we have to have uh, choices to read the best of works. So actually the most famous lines in the same uh, poem by Andrew Marvel, I think those uh, those of you who study English literature may have um, you know read this before. Um, uh, had we but worked enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. I mean, of course, this is a poem, a love poem. He's trying to get to the girl and say, hey, come, <laughs> don't be shy. Um, because, but at my back, I always hear Time's wind chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. So basically the idea is that time is limited. We have to you know, make the best of time. Of course, us longer vita brevis is a very famous Latin um, adage, basically the same idea, us longer, that is art, art, uh, not just the art in the modern sense, but all knowledge is long, vita, life is short, brief. This, of course, is what Zhuangzi says. My life has its boundaries, but the knowledge is boundless. To pursue the boundless with the bounded, that is perilous. So this is realized by all the ancient people. So we must choose and read the best works. And because I study comparative literature and world literature for a very long time, and I deeply sensed the imbalance of knowledge. And I really think that Chinese literature should be part of world literature. At least the best works of Chinese literature should be part of world literature. I actually uh, collaborated with a group of international student uh, scholars. We published a history, it's, it's an insane uh, title, Literature or World History. <laughs> it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I'll finish in, in, a, in a few minutes. Okay, yeah. Um, so um, we finally published a four volume uh, a big um, uh, book called Literature or World History. Uh, and I wrote Chinese history, uh, literature, uh, Chinese literature history in that book. But it's because it's, uh, it's an integration of all the major literary uh, traditions in the world. So every 
volume has its limited space. So I couldn't possibly write many of them. So finally, I wrote an independent work, A History of Chinese Literature was published um, uh, last year. Well, the copy page said 2023, but it's actually pop came out in uh, November last year, 2022, um, yes. Um, and this is a history of Chinese literature. Uh, so my idea is, is um, what literature could arise because of the almost consensus of, of, of uh, the critique of Eurocentrism. I think it's very important to realize Eurocentrism is not proposed by Asian scholars, but it's by Europeans and Americans themselves. And that's very important. There's a very long self-critique tradition in European culture, and that is very valuable. And we have to realize this. And But because of this, uh, it's possible now to talk about world literature in the real sense of the world's literature, not just European literature, okay? So world literature offers up excellent opportunity for non-European literatures and even minor European literatures to have their best works to be introduced to readers outside their own native environment. That is point, uh, that, that's why I write this history. It's not for Chinese readers, really for readers who have interest in Chinese literature but have no knowledge about Chinese. Um, so the rise of China and the multipolar world order made it possible uh, for more people, um, students and scholars are interested in Chinese literature and other non-Western literatures. But as I said, much of the work, you know, much of the world's literatures is still unknown and, and yet to be discovered. So world literature as a discovery uh, is is my uh, new book <laughs> just published, and world literature will be localized because it will be manifested in different parts of the world, and of course with different points of references. So world literature is unpredictable, is variable, is um, it should be uh, in different parts, and um, so um, this is what I I can say that world literature is on the rise, and it gives us opportunity to study uh, different literatures, different traditions of the world. And particularly for you young people, I think this is a very important task for you <laughs> to accomplish in your future career. Thank you very much. Maybe we can sit. You can sit. Let me, let me move, Miss. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> Quick Q and A. <laughs> Maybe we still have a little I time. Perfect standing. Actually. A perfect standing. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful <laughs> lecture. Actually, uh, I, I told you uh, because of time limit, we have to, you know, uh, sub uh, before four because there's another uh, uh, class, you know, after this. Uh, yeah, but. Um, yeah, actually, um, it's it's to our surprise, <laughs> uh, full house attendance <laughs> here. Yeah, and also the online. Also, you can see sixty. Yeah, so uh, you can see that how popular you are. <laughs> yeah, Professor Zhang. Um, I I can see that uh, really from the audience that that uh, how uh, enthusiastic you are. You know, at this uh, intriguing topic. You know, world literature and also especially the last part in relation with like a Chinese literature as one part, as one example, right? Uh, a specific case, yeah, but just one of them. And uh, indeed, actually, I think uh, uh, Professor Zhang's, uh, uh, you know, lecture today and his work uh, will inspire us, you know, to think more about this, this topic. But for this uh, really limited time, <laughs> we still have, I think we, we need to give the room to the next class, I think of five minutes to uh, four. So in this sense, let me see. We have, uh, how long? Uh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. So for the Q&A, uh, Q&A. So just to open the floor, 
for the audience. Uh, if you are interested, you know, any the the issues uh, that uh, Professor Zhang uh, has uh, talked about in 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 his lecture, and then you can raise your hand and uh, uh, just uh, ask. Yeah, and share. Yeah. All right. Uh, hello, Professor Zhang, and I found that your lecture is really kind of provoking. And I'm Jane, I'm from the uh, Faculty of Education. Uh, well, although my major does not relate to literature, but uh, I'm still quite interested about the world, the term world literature, because just now uh, you mentioned that perhaps it relates to the best or the first level or something, because uh, nowadays, even for the higher education, we have the kind of ranking. So I'm not sure how would you define the term best or the thing you mentioned, like the top uh, in literature. And uh, I also got a second question, yeah. <laughs> if you don't mind. And uh, my second question relates to the kind of how would you define Chinese literature? Because we know that for China, if we look back forward to the history uh, before early 19th, early 19th century, yeah. Uh, for example, in Ming Dynasty or Qing, uh, sorry, in Yuan Dynasty, we have uh, lots of minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not minority, uh, the ethnic minority, if I could say that. And uh, so, as China is a kind of multi-ethnic city uh, country, so uh, how would you define Chinese literature? Does that involve a lot about the uh, ethnics from minorities as well? Mm -hmm. So uh, to avoid the kind of ethnic centric, so uh, I'm not sure how would you- Yeah, I understand, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, the first question, how do you judge uh, what is the best work? Okay, I already said canonical or classical works. Every literary tradition also has a critical tradition, okay? It's not just we today judge what is the best. It has always been judged throughout centuries. As I said, Du Fu was thought as the greatest Chinese poet since Meat Tang, when he was still alive, okay? So it's not that today we say Du Fu is great, but it's been great, has been said by different generations. So that is the, um, um, so who does a judgment? It's not just by one person, one generation, it's by many, many different generations living under different social historical conditions. We say Du Fu is not, is the greatest poet, not because we're still in Tang Dynasty. If we don't say so, then maybe the emperor will kill us. No, no power can force you to love a work of literature. We love Shakespeare, not because we are afraid of Elizabeth, the queen, no. So that has nothing to do with that. Okay, so it's, uh, what we think is the best is internal respect and admiration. After you read this and so this is great work of literature, love it. Not because your mother, your father, not even your teacher or professor tells you, you must have this. Okay, so that's one thing. So in other words, the best works are judged by their own critical tradition, not imposed by other uh, outsiders, not by imposed by, but you know, for example, usually we would impose European judgment and saying, well, this is modernism, is classicism, but those works are all, the terms are all problematic when you apply to, let's say, Chinese literature. So that's one thing. Uh, okay, the second one, uh, the question about ethnic literature. Yes, when I talked about Chinese literature, I'm talking about mainly Han, written in Han Chinese Wenyan. Okay, now mind you, not just Han Chinese write in Wenyan. I already mentioned the Koreans, the Japanese, the Vietnamese all wrote in Wenyan. In ancient China, there are many, many poets. If you read Quan Tang Shi, the complete Tang poetry, many of them, not, not great number, but there were uh, poems written by Koreans and Japanese included in Quan Tang Shi. So the Chinese idea is only written in that language. Of course, there are also ethnic literature written in ethnic language. Let's say uh, Tibetan, for example, the uh, uh, the King Gezar uh, uh, saga is written in Tibetan as an uh, ethnic minority. You know, yes, compared with Han Chinese, Tibetans are a minority. 
but of course, when I write this, you know, if you're if you're studying Chinese literature in China, when you have all the different possibilities and discussed, of course, you should consider ethnic or minority uh, uh, writers and their their works. But what I'm talking about is outside China, in Europe, in America, they don't even begin to understand what is Chinese literature. I don't have the luxury to talk about everything. So I only talk about the major traditions and major writers and poets of Chinese literature. Okay. Okay, so uh, recent years, the uh, uh, scientific novel uh, Liu Cixin, Three Body, uh, it's become very popular in the world culture. So, what do you think about the uh, scientific novel? And another question is, uh, the most people, uh, the some people said uh, because of the uh, Chinese uh, literature, uh, literature have the chance to influence the world is scientific novel. So, what uh, do you agree with it? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> here, I must reveal my weakness. I don't read contemporary works. Okay, so I don't. Well, I have heard of of uh, uh, Sri Sandy uh, became, well, basically won a, a, a award uh, as science fiction. Uh, for me, this is too soon to judge, to say this work will be a great work of literature, let's say a hundred years later. I'll give you exa another example, very popular, that's Harry Potter's novels. Harry Potter novel was immediately translated into many di different languages when it's published. You know, it's not just read by children, but by adults as well, and made into many, many movies. I didn't read the novel, but I watched all the movies with my children. <laughs> I have to, anyway. But I'm not sure after ten, a uh, hundred years or fifty, you know, fifty years, uh, still will be a great work of literature. It could be. I'm not saying that there will not be. I'm not saying all bestsellers cannot be classics. No, some bestsellers will become classics. In Dickens' novels, many of them were published serially in a journal, in a magazine, and became uh, an, and then published as a book. And uh, many of them uh, become great works of English literature. So I'm not saying that best works are not necessarily uh, 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 best-selling books are not necessarily classics. It could be, but I cannot judge that at the moment. So that's why I don't read uh, contemporary works. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhang, for your uh, wonderful lectures. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the previous question on what's the best uh, mm -hmm. literature in Chinese literature, for instance. Uh, because even like in in Chinese literary tradition, especially in the modern era, it's uh, largely influenced and appropriate uh, Western or other uh, literary uh, critics and and criticism as well. So how to tackle that when you would like to judge uh, the best? within one uh, single literary tradition. Thank okay. You. Now, I never understand Chinese literature as a single, okay? If you think of Tang Dynasty, Tang, Tang, Han and Tang are very open societies. Now, I can ask you, what is a traditional Chinese musical instrument? You probably say Erhu, right? Erhu, the name already tells you is foreign, because Hu means foreign. So when you talk nonsense, you're Hu Zuo, <laughs> basically talking foreign language. So Hu in ancient China means foreign, and Er Hu is, you know, the great Chinese musical instrument. So China is very open, particularly in music. In Tang Dynasty, the origin of Ci poetry, or uh, Ci lyric, as I almost translated into English, Ci was popular because the Western regions, Xi Yu. Uh, it's referred to today as Xinjiang, actually. Uh, particularly Kucha, the ancient uh, state in Xin, uh, no longer exists, but in Xinjiang, uh, it's called Yan Yue. Yeah, Yan is Beifang. Yan is Yanjing. You know, uh, uh, Beijing or Yanjing. Uh, so Yan basically refer to north, northern. So it's northwestern part of China at that time, or uh, considered as foreign at that time. The Yan Yue became very popular in Tang China, 
but by by the way, Tang Emperor had some foreign blood actually. Who <laughs> so they are very open to different ethnicity and different races and different nations. So Tang was very open, and Ci, the origin of Ci had something to do with the popularity of Yan Yue because the tunes became so important. So it's less important to create a new poem, but fill the number of words to. Uh, so that's why I call it Tian Ci. You know, the Ci is already set. How many lines? How many characters each line? And and all these Ping Zhe Ge Lü, and you put words in it. Okay, so the, the, the origin of Ci was like that. So all these were saying Chinese literature was not just pure Han Chinese. I don't believe in purity of anything. You know, the good thing about Harry Potter novels is a tack. Of the purity, the idea of purity. Purity is almost like Nazi ideology. The Aryan race was the best, you know. So the bad guys were all pure, uh, pure wizards, and the good guys are Mughals. They are mixed with human beings. So that's a very modern and a very good idea in in the, in the Harry Potter uh, novels. So I don't believe in purity. Okay. Hi, Professor Zhang. Um, thank you for your intriguing lecture today. Um, you mentioned that um, the countries um, um, other than the, ma the major Western countries are uh, in a disadvantageous position mm -hmm. in world lit literature. So um, can you share some thoughts on how Japanese literature gained this um, status or popularity? in world literature and um, if China can learn something from Japan's experience. Thank you. Yes, um, I think like many other things, geopolitics has a tremendous influence. The Japanese became very popular, uh, particularly in the 1970s when, China, when Japan became the second largest <laughs> economy in the world. And that, that time, uh, American students, uh, many of them started to learn Japanese and, and so on. So Japan became very uh, popular or influential even uh, during that period of time. And now, of course, China becomes the second largest economy. But the difference is the Chinese society, uh, this political system is different from the Japanese. And therefore, uh, the rise of China had made many uh, political leaders in the West nervous. Therefore, the reaction is it's sanctions and trying to prevent China from rising <laughs> rather than uh, anything else. But then um, in, in, uh, in uh, the study of language and culture and literature, I think there is really rising interest. Um, when I was teaching in, in California, definitely, there are more and more students learning Chinese. And I heard recently the number is dwindling because of the political situation, I think. Yeah. So unfortunately, geopolitics has an influence on culture and even literature. So. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions over. The, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, a few questions over here. Um, I think I, uh, because of time limit, I have to be arbitrary, sorry, <laughs> to just pick the maybe, I think the first one is quite interesting. Maybe you could uh, answer. Uh, for this question, what role should the translator play in the formation of world literature? Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a is the universal esperanto uh, necessary in the process of writing and li world literature. Well, as I said, mm -hmm. from Goethe's talking about world literature, it's already mentioned um, already a very close relationship with translation because Goethe was not reading Chinese novel in the original. He was reading in the French translation. So translation became very important uh, for works of literature to become part of world literature. I mentioned English is today the de facto lingua franca. So works written in English has an advantage, but not even French or German, okay? Those works become much more popular when they translate into English. Even French theory, I can tell you that um, now everybody has heard of Derrida, right? Jacques Derrida, very famous. In early 1990s, 
I was in charge of comparative literature in the uh, in uh, in my university, UC Riverside, and we have we had that time a, a French graduate student from Marseille, and she came to do a PhD uh, in in the U.S. So I interviewed her and asked her what kind of works she had read, and she mentioned she uh, mentioned famous works like uh, Foucault and uh, Lacan and uh, 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 Roland Barthes. So I asked him, uh, have you read Jacques Derrida? She said, never heard of. That's 1990s. <laughs> so in other words, Derrida became very famous because he was made famous by basically Paul de Man at Yale University, the Yale School. And he taught in Yale actually many times. Actually, I met Derrida himself and had a conversation with him at Yale <laughs> for one afternoon. Uh, um, and so uh, he became very famous and well known through English translation. So this shows even French and German works became much better known and had a much greater influence in particularly scholarly circles if your work is translated into English. And that's the power of a lingua franca. But by the way, people were talking about hegemony of the English language, which I find is ridiculous. There's nothing hegemonic about any language. You can use English to write about anything, including the critique of English, the critique of hegemony of English. Uh, Amir Mufti, the Indian scholar, became famous by crit criticizing hegemony of English, but he published essay in English and, and published uh, in, written in English and published in Critical Inquiry, which is a very uh, famous old, uh, journal in the U.S. And he now has developed this into a book called Forget English, published in English again by Harvard University Press. So he knew where to publish and he knew what language was influential, even though this is really, I think, is ridiculous. He practiced what he does not argue and he argues for something he does not do. This is irony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhang. I think uh, for the other questions, really, uh, I'm sorry that we have to give the room to the next class. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because of time li limit. But um, uh, thank you for your efforts. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let's uh, just please join me to give uh, Professor Zhang another round of applause. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah.